Welcome to the show. Election 2016 is in the books, and we're going to be talking all about the election here today on the show. Last week we did our pre-election special edition. This will be our post-election special edition, so a little bit different format than what we're used to on a weekly basis. And here to discuss the election results with me is Howard Monroe, local radio show host on WKKX, WVLY. Howard, thanks for being here today. I appreciate you inviting me. I just for me, not a particularly exciting time because none of my candidates won, but uh, we'll talk about it and see how it all played out. Yeah, we had an opportunity to, to host a show on WLU-TV last night and watch the results come in and uh, quite a bit of surprise. And we'll start at the top with the presidential race. Of course, you know, the polls heading into this election were showing Hillary, Tr uh, Hillary Clinton with leads in the polls, Donald Trump having a very narrow path to the presidency, but it turns out it wasn't such a narrow path and, and some victories in states that were totally unexpected, like Wisconsin. It, 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 it's not something the general public gets all engaged about, but one of the big things that needs to be answered after this election is how could every single poll across the country get it so wrong? They weren't just wrong, they were literally upside down. Uh, two weeks ago, 538, one of the sites I look at, had Hillary Clinton with a 95% chance of winning. By 2 o'clock in the morning, New York Times, I was watching their trending, Trump at a 95%. I mean, it, how did that happen? How did every poll get it so wrong? Paul Ryan said after the um, election that Donald Trump saw things we, meaning the general public, didn't see. And you know what? Maybe he's right. Maybe Trump's instincts were better than the polls. Well, I, I think so. And the other thing I think that happens with the polls are that the polls oftentimes poll people that are considered to be likely voters. And a lot of times the likely voters are the people that they look at and say, these people have voted in the last this so many elections. And those are your traditional voters. I think Donald Trump brought out a lot of non-traditional voters, people that haven't voted in the last several elections. So the polling perhaps didn't capture, cap, uh, capture those people, and they did turn out at the polls perhaps. Well, and the Trump campaign had talked about, uh, Kellyanne Conway talked about the undercover uh, voter, the ones that really didn't want to say they were going to vote for Donald Trump, but did. The day after the election, two people that I'm pretty close to sort of whispered to me, i got to tell you the truth, I voted for him. Had no idea. You know, I, I never came out. They weren't going to say it out loud ahead of time, but they did. So there's probably some of that, too. But, again, it's not the general public cares so much about polling, but since so much of not just our campaigning, but of our governing anymore is run by polling, I think we've got to take a long, hard look at what went wrong here? You know, maybe, maybe it's time for politicians to start trusting their guts and not worry so much about polling, not think so much about let's put a poll in the field and see what the people say. You do what your gut tells you is right. I was not a Donald Trump supporter, but maybe he was onto something there. He read the people better than we did. Well, the other thing he's done is he's really, <clears throat> I think, understands the American people in 2016 in the sense of reality TV, social media, the ways in which we get our information, the ways in which we process our information, the way in which people act is very different than it was uh, four years ago, eight years ago, certainly 12, 16 years ago, uh, because reality TV, social media have become such a big part of our lives, and he's a master of it when it comes right down to it. Yeah, he, I mean, presidential politics in particular is a television medium anymore. And he's a master of it. I mean, he was the celebrity apprentice. He, he, he knows how to do it, to play it right, to play it well. Um, and, and I'm not saying that's bad. Uh, maybe someone who understands that medium has, just simply has a better job. Clearly, this was a Donald Trump win. It was Now, the Republican Party had a big sweep around our region, too. But it wasn't really a Republican win. This was a Donald Trump win. He was a man of his own there. Well, and you know, Let's talk about that a little bit. Of course, uh, Donald Trump won West Virginia, but in West Virginia, a Democratic governor elected, Jim Justice, who has some similarities to Donald Trump in some ways. Both very wealthy men, both first-time politicians, both older gentlemen. You know, I think there's some similarities there, and some people say, well, this, this Republican wave that's maybe come in West Virginia, but then West Virginia elects a Democratic governor. Well, there's some similarities there. Well, there is, and, and again, I don't think it was Democrat. Look, an awful lot of, of progressive Democrats really weren't comfortable with Jim Justice. A lot of them said, well, he really almost is a Republican. He's over on this side of the Democratic aisle, at least. 
Um, but it was Jim Justice, the individual, the character. I don't mean that in a bad way, but I mean the, the character, Jim Justice, that people were voting for. And as you point out, there were some key things. Jim Justice took away the power. The, what's the biggest power Republicans in this entire area had in all of their elections? The Obama-Clinton war on coal. Jim Justice just took that away from day one. He, how could, he's a coal baron, so you can't use that against him. And he made it quite clear he wasn't going to vote for Hillary Clinton. He made it quite clear he didn't believe in the EPA regulations and so on. So the biggest tool that they had in their arsenal was gone. So again, although there clearly was a trend, I don't want to dispute that, it's a personal thing, an individual thing here with Jim Justice uh, and Bill Cole. Well, he also, I think in his ads, you know, was a very uh, relatable, kind of a... Uh, invited people into his home. I mean, he and his wife, you, you're walking right into their home with them, and he, there's the dogs. So I think he did some things to make himself relatable to the people, despite being extremely wealthy, and that, that played well here in West Virginia. We need to take a break. We come back. Howard Monroe and I will continue talking about election 2016. Stay with us here on the Jamie Bordas Show. You know, Danoon Lumber is the place for quality natural hardwoods. And now you can take advantage of these offers to get your home ready for the holiday season. Three and a quarter inch red oak tongue and groove flooring for $4.25 per square foot. Just in time for Christmas, children's rocking chairs only $115. Add the wow to any room with rustic walnut barn doors. As we always say, better grade, better selection, better price, better hurry. Danoon Lumber. Panhandle Cleaning and Restoration has been restoring homes after disasters for nearly four decades. Through that experience, we present Panhandle Custom Homes, Kitchens, and Baths. We handle your entire project, from concept to completion, working with you every step of the way. From the budget-minded upgrade to a fully custom remodel, you can trust the Panhandle name. Panhandle Custom Homes, Kitchens, and Baths. Welcome home. Welcome back to the show. We're talking election 2016, our wrap up to this year's election and been talking a little bit about the state of West Virginia and the governor's race. And with me here today is Howard Monroe, radio show uh, host here on WKKX WBLY. And Howard, I think we need to look at the state of West Virginia in a broader sense as well. You know, governor went Democratic, but the Board of Public Works, the other the other offices, the statewide offices went largely Republican. Uh, and let's start with Secretary of State, Natalie Tennant, who uh, has been a, in politics for a number of years now in West Virginia and was a rising star in the Democratic Party at one time, was defeated by Mac Warner last night for the Secretary of State race, so she'll be uh, leaving that office. Certainly one of the biggest surprises to me. I, I, I expected Mac Warner to put up a pretty good uh, campaign fight, but I really did not expect Natalie Tennant to lose. Um, the Republicans, you know, the, the Board of Public Works, the last bastion of Democratic stronghold uh, in, in West Virginia. You know, the, the, the Senate, the governors, of course, but the Senate and the House have gone, and now they were going after the Board of Public Works and got them all except for, for one. Uh, and Natalie Tennant, um, uh, I, I, I don't know what happened there. I mean, she is a likable person. I think as Secretary of State, she did a tremendously good job. Mac Warner found some, uh, a couple of issues that exposed some concerns that, that with her doing her job, um, but uh, she was able to, not able to hold on to that, which pr was the biggest surprise to me, probably uh, statewide. And the question I have is, what does Natalie Tennant do next? Yeah, you know, we have somebody here who, who people talked about someday being a governor who ran for U.S. Senate uh, two years ago and now uh, loses for Secretary of State, ousted from her re-election bid. So where does she go? I, mean, I have to think some type of maybe political appointment. You know, her, her background was as a TV anchor. Probably not going to go back to that, I wouldn't think, but uh, she's got to angle for some type of appointment or something in government, I would think, with well, her, I, the experience that she's gained there. And I think that's where her heart and her passion are, or, I mean, government. Um, I'm sure that she could, probably could find a job back in television. Somebody would hire her, maybe a PR a firm or, or a spokesperson for a big company, but I don't think that's her passion to the extent that I know her. I know her a little bit. Uh, I think her passion is public service, so uh, uh, some kind of a public appointment probably would make sense. I don't know. And does she have any political future after this? Um, as you said, she, she really had her eye, I know, on the governor's mansion at one time. Took a run for that. In, that was in that interim term. Everybody took a run for that. That was people just sort of 
testing the waters. Lost that, not a big deal. The Senate race, uh, what, two years ago, I guess it was, big loss for her. And my thought had been that she would settle into Secretary of State maybe for a couple of terms, just kind of calm the waters. But now she's out of that. So um, uh, big surprise, and I don't know where she goes next. You have to wonder whether or not the, the, the bid for U.S. Senate against Shelley Moore Capito, in which she was beaten pretty soundly, ended up hurting her here for this election for Secretary of State. Sometimes if you get a little bit of a dent in your armor, uh, it emboldens the other side, says, hey, this person's vulnerable, makes your own supporters think, ah, I don't know, do I need to get behind her? And there could have been the other effect, too, which is some of the Democratic supporters could have thought, now he doesn't really need my help, she's going to be fine, she'll win. So it could have been a little bit of both there. Well, I, I think so. Uh, you know, uh, Before she announced that she was running for Senate two years ago, we talked privately about this, uh, and I don't think it was confidential, but we talked privately about it, and, and she said, look, if I lose, if I run and lose, I may have killed my political career. And it may well have been that. Again, that's why I thought she might settle into Secretary of State for a few terms, which is at least not generally not a real controversial position, right. and do the job. And she's done it, in my opinion, well, um, but, uh, but not, not now. She's out in January. And I think it shows, to, to some extent, you know, these Board of Public Works races, you know, Natalie Tennant loses, Walt Helmick, the commissioner, Democratic Commissioner of Agriculture, loses uh, an incumbent. You know, you had the other races that were open for uh, assessor, uh, Republican wins, uh, J.B. McCuskey wins there. You have um, the uh, treasurer's race was the only one where the Democrats really stayed in office with uh, John Perdue, but everything else uh, kind of went the Republican way, so to speak. And, and John Perdue just is a, is a pretty quiet, keeps his head down kind of guy, non-controversial, very little ever complained about him. And, and he's built a very good organization around the state, too. I mean, he's, he's got a good political uh, organization around the state. So he keeps his seat, but everybody else is, is gone. And I think you're right. Uh, and, and we saw it all around this region, around West Virginia. We saw it in the local area. We saw it in Ohio, uh, in the, the commissioner's race and some others in Belmont County that we'll talk about. There was just a, it's not a throw the bums out. I don't even know that's anti-incumbency. It was just sort of a, you know, Howard Beale, we're mad as heck and not going to take it anymore kind of thing. You know, Let's talk about the state Senate for a minute. Uh, we'll get to the local races, uh, you know, in the next segment. But the state Senate, there was some thought that by the Democrats that they could flip control back to the Democratic Party. It was a close majority for the Republicans, 18 to 16. But instead, the Republicans expanded their majority there, now 22 to 12 yeah. in favor of the Republicans, with some of the Democratic incumbents getting knocked off and also some of the would-be challengers and, and people, the Democrats thought they had a really good chance of knocking off the Republican Party. It just didn't happen. Well, certainly two of them were up here. I mean, two key races were the first and second senatorial district, which are in our local area. Uh, Jack Yost loses to Ryan Weld. Uh, Lisa Zukoff loses the second senatorial seat, which has been Jeff Kessler's for 20 years, uh, to uh, Dr. Maroney. So those are two Democrat seats that are taken away right away. Stephen Skinner, uh, who moved from a delegate to run for the Senate, was anticipated to be a great Democrat hope, loses his reelection. Mitch Carmichael holds on, if I remember correctly. He, by a, uh, he had a, a very competitive race with Brian Prim, but held on. So those, are, those right, four right there were critical. They were. We'll talk about some of those local races and what the, what the local areas, Ohio, Brook, Hancock counties did in those races when we come back. Stay with us here on the Jamie Bordas Show. Every day, more than 70,000 puppies and kittens are born in the United States. Just one female can contribute more than 2 million offspring in eight years. At the Tiffany DeLess Spay and Neuter Clinic, we are trying to help. We offer reduced cost services to income qualified families from all over the Ohio Valley. We understand that the cost of owning a pet can be overwhelming, and that stress multiplies when they do. Call the Tiffany DeLess Spay and Neuter Clinic or visit us online to find out if we can help you. People always ask me what it means to be a dealer for the people. For the people is a simple idea. It means we believe that everybody deserves to drive a nicer, newer car. This belief drives the entire team at Robinson Auto Group to care more, to try harder, and to work smarter. Whatever's keeping you from driving that car you want, I guarantee we'll try our best to help you. We're Robinson Auto Group, and we're the dealer for the people.
Welcome back to the show. We're talking election 2016. It's over now. And Howard Monroe, radio host on WKKX and WVLY, is here with me today to talk about it. And Howard, we've been talking about the state Senate and how the Republicans maintained and expanded their control of the Republican or of the state Senate. And interesting, though, to look at these local races that we've been talking about a little bit. Jack Yost uh, defeated by Ryan Weld, who was a delegate, Republican delegate uh, out of Brook County. But you look at the breakdown, Jack Yost also from Brook County. One, Jack Yost wins Ohio County, right. loses Brook and Hancock. The same mix we saw two years ago in the race between Ryan Ferns and Rocky Fitzsimmons. Rocky Fitzsimmons wins, the Democrat wins Ohio County. Brooke and Hancock, which had traditionally been Democratic strongholds, yep. went for the Republican Ryan Ferns. And that, that trend played out again here this time. It, it, it did indeed. And, and I, I'm not exactly sure why Hancock County has become a big decision maker in, in this district anymore. Um, Ohio County is kind of the, I don't know, I think a lot of, of, of candidates see it as the, the big you know, uh, sort of the big enchilada, but you've got to deal with those upriver up uh, counties as well. And um, uh, again, two, two terms in a row. But again, I think, I think if we look at the whole state, there's, there's, a tr there's some trends happening statewide. Two years ago, what I called was the red bloodbath. It was just a complete swath of, of red that uh, I said, all right, it was an, it was an anomaly year I'm beginning to think it wasn't an anomaly. There's, there's, there's movement happening in the state. Well, here's I, how I look at it, Howard. You know, if you look at, at Ohio County, our, our economy is more diverse here in Ohio County than it is in Brook and Hancock, than it is in, to the south. Uh, we have a, a lot more uh, di diversity in terms of types of jobs, whereas Brook and Hancock rely heavily upon the steel industry. You go south of us, rely heavily upon coal. And I think that those areas that have been affected and have, have had the job losses look at the party that has been in control for a number of years in West Virginia, the Democratic Party, and look and say that's who's to blame. And so in Ohio County, you see the candidates doing better where you've got a more maybe diverse economy, but in those other areas where you haven't, they've looked to the Republican Party and said, can you help us fix this? And I think that may be one of the reasons that we're seeing Ohio County go Democrat in the, in the areas on to the North and South, maybe go Republican. And I think that's a really good point, and I, and I think it, it's, it's tapping into that same sort of um, working class frustration, if you will, that Donald Trump tapped into. The, the, the industrial class, uh, Brooke and Hancock County, more of that, as you point out, frustrated that they can't return to the glory days. Weird and Steel is gone. Uh, the Wheeling Pit plants are gone. What do we do? Uh, and so you, you turn to something new, and it's the Republicans in this case. I think you're right. You look at Michigan, you know, on a, on a national level. You know, Donald Trump, you know, going to win Michigan in a lot of likelihood. And, you know, is, is doing well in the other areas of the Rust Belt. And those are the industrialized areas that have lost jobs. And I, so I think that the Republican Party, Donald Trump in particular, has, has captured that. And I think we're seeing it here too. You look at the first, uh, excuse me, the second senatorial district, s some similar trends. Lisa Zukoff, the Democrat, wins Marshall County for that Senate race, but loses down the river. Loses in uh, Wetzel, Tyler, Ritchie, Doddridge, you know, those areas, uh, that's where Mike Maroney did well. He ended up winning. So I, I think you see Ohio and Marshall a little bit of an anomaly right now compared to the state. Well, I, I think so. And it's also interesting in these races that this year uh, labor put a huge push on. I mean, they had the Remember in November campaign. They, they helped fund the Western Family Values a third party group. Labor put a big push on to try to get labor behind the primarily Democratic candidates and to try and bring about a change. And uh, I, I don't know if they had any successes, but very few. I guess uh, Sean Fleurty might have been one, but very few successes, even though they put a ton of money into it and really targeted this and worked it aggressively, just couldn't turn some of those things around. Yeah, you, you mentioned Sean, and, and Sean did get reelected as a Democrat here in uh, the, the 3rd District in Ohio County. So, you know, in Ohio County, one Democratic delegate and Sean Fluharty, one Republican delegate, Eric Astorch, in, in Marshall County, actually picked up a Democratic delegate. Mm -hmm. Mike Farrow reelected, but Joe Canestro uh, defeats uh, David Evans, who was the Republican incumbent there. So in, in Ohio and Marshall counties, three of the four delegates are Democrats. Just not something, not a trend at all that you see around the state of West Virginia, but, but here in those two counties, able to, to maintain uh, uh, kind of Democratic control when you look at Yost winning the Senate, Zukoff winning the Senate race in Marshall County, uh, but losing overall for those two. And then, but then the delegates, three out of four. You know, it's also interesting to, to look at the third district 
And although we're talking about this sort of, again, let's change, or get rid of the incumbents, uh, anti-establishment, whatever phrase we want to use, but who does Ohio County send back? The two incumbents. Right. Erica Storch led the ticket. Sean Fluherty comes in second. Both, uh, I think, are both well-respected and both have a good, strong uh, you know, group of support. Scott Reed did actually better than I thought he would uh, up against uh, Sean Fluherty in, for the second place. But um, you look at that, we sent you know, the Ohio County Center, the third delegate district sent two incumbents back. Yeah, and that's uh, not something that you saw kind of around the state. There, there, there was a lot of change, but... Uh, you know, I think Sean's to be commended for the race he ran. He ran a very positive campaign, didn't go negative, and Sean's a positive guy. I mean, he just is. He's, he's got a lot of energy, a lot of fight in him, and, uh, and, and believes in what he believes, and I think people respect that. Sean is a very aggressive, very passionate guy, very thoughtful guy. I mean, his arguments are not talking point arguments. They are well-thought-out arguments, and he is a likable guy. I know I've talked to him a lot, and, and he says he, go, he went to a, he said he picked, sometimes he picked Republican homes to go to in his door to dooring and, you know, sort of a, a fight would get, would ensue. Well, I can't believe you did this. But he said he enjoyed saying, no, wait a minute, let me explain to you why. I don't know if any of those people choose to vote for him, but I think he's just a likable guy and he doesn't shy away from a pleasant explanation of why he believes what he does. I see him as a rising star of the Democratic Party. And, and we've been talking on my radio show a little bit about what does the Democratic Party have to do in West Virginia. I think one of the things the party has to do is look for more rising stars. And I think Sean Flaherty is a good example of that. We need to start building a better bench strength. We need to take a break. We come back, we'll talk about some of the other local races like Sheriff, Assessor, and maybe even the Belmont County Commission. Stay with us here on the Jamie Borders Show. At Progressive Bank, our loan process is unique. It's personal. Our local lenders ease your mind and help you get the loan you need and deserve. Progressive Bank, personal bankers with millions to lend to local families and businesses. Come in, Ohio Valley. We're lending. Fighting for homeowners. Fighting for workers. Fighting for children. Fighting for mineral owners. Fighting for patients. Fighting for policyholders. Bordas and Bordas, fighting for justice. Progressive Bank understands borrowing money can be a daunting experience. Our local lenders ease your mind and help you get the loan you need and deserve. Progressive Bank, personal bankers with millions to lend to local families and businesses. Come in, Ohio Valley. We're lending. Welcome back to the show. We are talking election 2016 now that it's all over. This is our post-election special show. And with me today has been Howard Monroe, radio show host with WKKX, WBLY. Howard, thanks uh, so much for uh, having been here today on the show. And we've kind of covered a lot of the races. And what we haven't talked about are some of the very, very local races, which are Ohio County Sheriff to start with, you know, uh, two-term limit here in West Virginia for sheriff, so had to have a new sheriff. And Pat Butler uh, had to move on, and um, yeah. Tom Howard, the Democrat, wins that race. Um, uh, Tom Howard, uh, school resource officer for the Wheeling Police Department, has huge ties to the school system. It's, it's always good to have connections with the kids and their families, and he is well-respected, I think, by the kids, and that certainly came through with his, uh, with his vote. Yeah, I think so, and you know, not only the kids, but also his connections with local law enforcement. And yep. lo you know, another race that was uh, local here was Assessor. You know, uh, our Assessor passed away. Uh, she was up for re-election, Kathy Hoffman, and uh, her daughter actually uh, put her name then on the ballot. Uh, her name was put on the ballot. She didn't put it there, but she was named by the party to take her mother's place. And, uh, Kind of a nice story that she won, I think, because uh, of her mother passing away. Yeah, and, and I think in the beginning there were some who did a little, you know, wait a minute, this dynasty stuff, why does she get to be the, the, the nominee just because it was her mom? But I think there was no, I mean, that she overcame that quickly and people liked her and felt that this was a good, uh, you know, a good decision. Coming back to the theme that I was talking about last segment, you know, here in, in, in Ohio County, Democratic prosecuting attorney elected, Democratic Democrat sheriff, 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 Democrat for assessor, uh, the other races really weren't contested, but they were Democrat. Democrat for the circuit clerk and Brenda Miller, you know. Randy uh, Wharton. Randy Wharton is as Ohio County Commissioner, not even opposed. So Democrats continue to do okay here in Ohio County. But looking across the river to Belmont County, you know, Whew. not at all what people maybe expected. You know, Belmont County Commission, uh, you know, Matt Coughlin defeated, um, you know, 
probably not expected. I mean, I, th I, th I think people ex widely expected him to win. I consider that an uncontested race. I mean, he had a challenger, Jason Meyer, yeah. I think. I, but essentially, I thought it was an uncontested race. There really was very little activity. I don't think that the Republican candidate did a whole lot of work. I thought that was essentially Coughlin just is there. Uh, I was stunned to see him out. And then, of course, a very hotly contested race for the other commissioner's seat. J.P. Dutton, the Republican, prevails there as well you know, over uh, Mike Bianconi, the Democrat, and also Brian Shamba, uh, the Independent, who had been a Marshall County assessor before moving over to Ohio a couple years ago and now running for election there as an Independent. But, you know, two uh, Republican commissioners elected in Belmont County and uh, something that hasn't been seen in quite some time. I was talking to uh, the, the last remaining Democrat commissioner, Mark Thomas, a couple of days ago, and he and I were discussing, and he said, I don't re ever remember, and I've covered the Belmont County Commissioner as a reporter going all the way back to the 70s. I don't remember a, a, a Republican commissioner in Belmont County. I don't know how far back you have to go to find one, and now we got two. Yeah, so some, some, some changes being seen there on, on that side of the river in Belmont County, and of course, um, you know, Republican congressman uh, reelected re there. Uh, Bill Johnson. Yeah, and uh, of course for state senate, uh, Portman uh, elected. And so Ohio, and of course, went for uh, Trump you know, in, the, in the presidency. So seeing and both Lou Gentile for the state senate and uh, Jenny Favitt, who ran a, a challenge to Andy Thompson for the 95th House seat, both were defeated. Two Democrats defeated there as well. Yeah, good point. So locally in Ohio, not just, uh, you know, with respect to the presidency, but also locally, uh, Republicans did very well over in Ohio here uh, in the Ohio Valley. So keep an eye on that toward future elections. But uh, Howard, I appreciate you being here with me today on the show to, to discuss this. Uh, it really, uh, I think, uh, helps our viewers understand and break down what happened and maybe why it happened. So Always happy to talk politics, yeah, even well, when I'm depressed at what happened at the election. And you can always check out Howard. He talks about these things, uh, you know, every single day on his uh, radio show. So check out his show. But I'd like to encourage all of you to uh, heal. We need to come together as a nation, as a state, as an area. Whether your candidate won or lost, we need to remember we're all Americans. We're all West Virginians or Ohioans, whichever it may be. We're all members of the Ohio Valley. And what we need to do is say, we're all together now. The election is over. Let's let it be done and let's support whoever won, whether it was your candidate or not, so we can all help to do our part to make this a special place to live, a special time to live, and so that we can all care about one another. Next week, we'll be back to one of our regular shows. Thanks for joining us here on this post-election special edition of The Jamie Bordis Show. We'll see you again next week.